From the Gail Lemron Auditorium on the campus of Embry-Riddle, welcome to the Embry-Riddle Speaker Series event. A very different event, an afternoon encounter where we talk about transhumanism and ethics and technology. This is a very special installment as Harry and Ada Lehman have made monies available to present this as part of their continuing series of distinguished speakers. To talk about this gifting, I'm asking Reverend David Keck to join me live to talk about the significance of today's event in the speaker series. David? Good afternoon, everyone. And we want to thank Harry and Ada Lehman and their generosity. Um, Harry uh, was a lawyer, and at one point in his career, he learned about Embry-Riddle. He became involved in the community here, and he became a member of the Board of Trustees. He's now a trustee emeritus, and he sends his greetings. He and Ada send their greetings from Atlanta. He's no longer able to travel. Uh, but they send their greetings, and they're glad that you are here. And we want to thank them. We want to thank their dedication to the university, not just with the speaker series, but with serving on the Board of Trustees. Harry recognized this is a special school. It's a wonderful group of students and faculty and staff. And he served as a trustee member, and they continue to serve by making this speaker series possible. And Harry's concern was that students who are getting a terrific education in the sciences as a STEM university also have an opportunity to think humanistically, to think about ethics and the significance and meaning of what you all are learning about and the implications for the future because you are the future. And so Harry and Ada set this speaker series up and really glad to have Professor Kravchik here with us and really glad that you all are here. Thank you. So without any further ado, the way the format runs is the same consistent way we've done it for the last several years. In this case, Dr. Kraftchik will make a presentation of approximately 20 to 25 minutes. You will be able to see it on the screen behind me. Then he'll join me for a short interview, and then we'll incorporate your questions from the audience. And remember, students always come first here at Embry-Riddle. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please allow me to reintroduce our distinguished guest today from Emory University, Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Stephen Kratchik. Thanks for being here. I think there's a big question of why do you have somebody who's a religionist come talk to a series of engineers and flight folks and computer experts? And I have the same question, but I'm going to try to answer it some today. This topic is interesting to me because I actually started off as a mathematics major and did work in computer science. When I did it, you did a series of punch cards, took them to a big auditorium about this size, left your program there overnight, came back only to discover the next day that it didn't run. Um, and when you finally got it working, it was able to demonstrate that two plus two was four. I wanna thank you for letting me be here, thank the layman's for endowing this. Thanks to Dr. Keck, uh, to the folks who were here as students yesterday who shuttled me around, both Morgan and Ryan, and thanks to Mark for hosting this. I am not a computer scientist. I'm not an engineer. I'm actually a religionist. I teach New Testament studies at Emory University. And I got into this topic because I discovered when I would give students a long document to read, they didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't think the problem was with the students' minds. They were just as bright as the other students that I had. And so I began to wonder, well, maybe I'm just getting to be a worse teacher than I used to be. But that was an unacceptable uh, solution for me. And I began to look at how they were reading. Turns out most folks today read digitally. They do not read books anymore. And if you keep reading digitally, it changes the way in which you read, not just your habits, but actually your brain structure. You read a book by Nicholas Carr called The Shallows, you'll discover that. When I got into it, I discovered that technology just doesn't change the way in which we see things, it actually changes our bodies. And I became interested in the relationship of technology to human existence, and particularly embodiment. The other question you might have is, why Frankenstein? Well, that novel, it's 200 years old this year. It was written by an 18-year-old, or basically the somebody who's a freshman or a sophomore here. It's been in print ever since. 
She conceived this novel in relationship to her then paramour, um, Perspicy Shelley, and Lord Byron on a summer vacation. The novel most people haven't read. Most people know Frankenstein as the cultural icon. So most of us, most of you know Frankenberry, I suspect, more than you do this novel. But the novel is uh, one of the first gothic novels that had to do with science fiction. It's a horror story, and it's a cautionary tale. It has great cultural legacy, and lots of interesting topics occur in it. Its motifs are at limits. So what's the relationship of the rational to the emotional, or a person to an object, or a human to a non-human? And all of those things incorporate folks from the sciences, from engineering, from economics, from the romantic movement, from poetry. But I'm in particularly interested today in the notions of what's our responsibility to those things we create? And in particular, what does it mean to be an explorer? Can you do this individually, or do you need to do it communally? So in Mary Shelley's novel, Victor Frankenstein, by the way, he wasn't a doctor. He was a university student. And the creature is quite articulate in her novel. He creates a living being with the hope of creating a superior version of humanity. But like Prometheus, he pays a price for his aspirations. And a modern scientist could still share the same goals as Victor Frankenstein, but with one great difference. We truly have scientific tools to modify and perhaps even create living things today. And that's going on in labs right now. Even at Georgia Tech, they're able to reproduce organic material. In the novel, as soon as Victor Frankenstein creates the creature, what was an exciting moment becomes something that horrifies him. And he runs away and hides in hopes that the creature will die. But of course, the creature doesn't. And the responsibility that he has to this creature is abandoned. He's the parent. He's the creator. And he leaves a child by itself. My question is, what happens when what we create doesn't look like what we expected to create? And there's a little cartoon there. We're actually messing around right there with DNA and CRISPR, wondering what happens if a germline gets out in public. And Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, named this the Frankenstein complex. That is, what happens when the creation isn't exactly what we anticipated? Why do I say that this is a new thing? Well, right now, what's happening in our technological world is a significant ramp up in what's called grain technologies. We're doing genetic testing. We're able to do genetic splicing. We're able to work with DNA, even in embryo. Robotics, things are getting faster and smaller and quicker and more maneuverable. We're not dealing with just individual robots, but with swarms. So things are now moving into a quicker, cheaper, faster way. Artificial intelligence is ramping up significantly. Informatics has shifted significantly, and we're moving into realms of nanotechnology. When all of these things come into play, they don't come into play individually. There's a synergy going on. And that synergy is moving us into a hyper-technological world. When I was in grad school, my first computer was a K-Pro 2. Does anybody here even remember K-Pro? That it weighed 26 pounds. And it was a portable. It cost $1,600, and it had 63K of memory. I don't have it on me because I don't trust it anymore. But my iPhone costs pennies now compared to that. And it has more computing power than the computers that sent the first rocket to the moon. Almost everybody in here has some sort of smart device. I'm not sure why we call them phones anymore, because my kids will not call me on them. They will text me or send me photos, but if I call and leave a voicemail, that's not how they communicate. That rapid and catalytic convergence of these technologies 
is forcing us to reconsider what we call human. Artificial technology is bumping up against sentience. And when you bump up against sentience, you bump up against the notion of what a person is. So just recently, an Uber self-driving car hit a pedestrian. Who's responsible for that? The computer programmers? The automobile itself? The person that stepped off the curb? A human person or a non-human person? And so we have to start thinking about ourselves not just as homo faber, that is, the thing that creates, the human that creates, or homo sapien, the one that thinks, or even homo descriptor, the one who describes or represents, which is what scientists do, but homo technicus. That is, we're in a symbiotic relationship with our technologies. And unfortunately, we have to think about that even while we're participating in it. As you can see with what's going on right now with Facebook and Cambridge Analytics. I'll let them figure that out. I want to point out to you that on the, your left-hand side is a typical economic projection by a fellow named Schumpeter, and you'll notice that he has five waves. The first wave took 60 years over, from water power to steam and rail when the Industrial Revolution took place. The second wave, 55 years. The third wave, 50 years the fourth wave, 40 years, and the wave that we're in right now, roughly 30 years. Notice that the wave starts from innovation and things are moving kind of slowly, and then as people grasp what the innovation can do, it starts to ramp up and it reaches a peak. And then once the in innovation has sort of run its course, things drop down and another innovation occurs. So there's kind of wave and trough going on a nice sine curve more or less, but it gets compressed in terms of time. On the right is what's called the singularity. These projections come from a fellow named Ray Kurzweil. Have you heard this name? Moog synthesizers, and now he's an engineering genius out at Google. His suggestion is that this no longer works for us on the left-hand side. We're not going to trough. We're actually going to reach a kind of exponential thing when all of these technologies come together, we won't run out of innovation. And we might reach a point where we move to a new form of being human, to become trans or post-human because of the integration of the technology with the self. That's a scary thought for a lot of folks. For some people, it's exciting. I just want us to talk about it for a while. Here's some ways in which we define AI, which is one of the results of that singularity. On the left, there's a notion of AI could be to produce machines with minds in the full and literal sense. That is, they'll think like we do. And they will act like we do. And so one way to think about AI is not emulation, but reproduction. On the other side, it's machines that can be rational. They can think and think about thinking. And in fact, we're pretty close there. We have self-teaching machines now. They can act and act rationally. And so we're progressing in that manner. Now, the thing about this that AI of the second sort is more likely the thing that we're going to see in the near future. AI of the first sort, we'll wait and see whether we can get there. But what we don't know is what to do with unintended consequences. So anybody have an Alexa in their house? Has it giggled at you yet? Some folks programmed this computer with has pretty high artificial intelligence to laugh at things. And all of a sudden, it would just start laughing for no good reason, which was pretty creepy to a lot of people. But nobody had made it malicious. They had just sort of figured out a way to have it communicate with human beings. You could program a computer, theoretically, to eradicate cancer in the world. And the way that it could do that most efficiently 
is to get rid of cancer hosts, folks like you and me. It would be an unintended consequence, but it would be very efficient. Stephen Wolfram, do you folks know about Stephen? Mathematician and physicist. He argues that in fact the AI of the first sort is not that far away. There's no bright line between intelligence and mere computation. So if we can make computers faster, more efficient, smaller, more portable, more communicative, ramp up the computing mechanisms through sort of quantum computing, we may come very close to creating intelligent machines. The only difference will be the sort of difference that what Wolfram refers to is the weather has a mind of its own, it just happens to be alien to our mind. So we might now start to occupy the world with other alien minds of our own creation. And the question is, how are we going to get along with one another? Well, welcome to the second inning. These are some notes that I took actually this morning from an essay by Thomas Friedman, which occurred in the New York Times opinion column. On the left-hand side is some statements about what is called technical sweetness. And I think everybody who's ever participated in a project has participated in technical sweetness, where you keep banging your head against the wall until it finally all seems to come together. And when it finally all comes together, you, you can't stop but continue to do it and you just keep moving forward as quickly as can, you can. And sometimes it works and sometimes it gets in, you in trouble. So to give you a real quick illustration, I was helping my wife reconstruct our bathroom a few years ago from the ground up. So we tore everything out and it came time to put the tub in and tile it on the surface. And I tiled everything on the surface and I was sitting in the tub, there was no water in it at that point, trying to figure out how am I gonna put the fixtures in because I'd tiled over the deck. And so I kept thinking about it and obsessing about this problem and it finally came to me and I started to get out some drills and bore some holes in the tile and she stopped me and went across the street to our engineer friend and he came in and said, oh, I can solve this. He took a hammer and banged out the drywall and said, just put them in over here. I was so fixated on the technical sweetness of my solution that I couldn't see good solutions. Victor Frankenstein was fixated on the technical, technical sweetness of his almost discovery. Sometimes it gets us in trouble. We don't see what's right in front of us because we're so locked into what's right in front of us. Well, that's inning number two. Of all the headlines that were going on, in terms of all the wonderful things that occur in terms of technology. It's alluring, it's consuming, it's exciting, it's energizing. If you don't think that's true, think about how many times you start in on Facebook and realize that two hours have gone by where you're playing Candy Crush or liking things or filling out photo whatevers we're filling out, telling people what we had for breakfast. By the way, you have agreed to give all of that data to those folks up there. On the other side of this is the deeply unsettling story, and he's referring to that young person who was hit by the Uber car. Welcome to the second inning, the second inning of one of the world's great technological leaps, the implications of which we're just beginning to understand. When we're just beginning to understand things about technology, our media tends to paint it in one of two ways, either utopian, everything is gonna be great, or dystopian, nothing's gonna be great. And you can think about movies you've watched like Blade Runner, or iRobot, or War Games, or WALL-E. I don't think those are the only two ways we can talk about this. I think there's a third way, and that's represented over here by the blurry robots from Star Wars world, 
where we're in a symbiotic relationship. Things are neither dystopian nor utopian. The dystopian and utopian projections argue that the future is determined. We can't do anything about it. I'm suggesting the future is not determined. We can determine what the future might be. But in order to do that, we have to participate in forms of conversation about who we want to be, what our world could be, what it looks like to live in a world of symbiosis. There are some folks who argue that the way to get to this is to wholly embrace technology. They're called transhumanists, and you might have heard of some of the more famous ones, like Ray Kurzweil or Max Moore or Natasha Vita Moore. They're the more celebrated folks, but there are a lot of very serious people, committed ethicists, committed scientists, committed technologists, who think that rather than wait for things to happen, we should embrace what we have and try to overcome some of the limits of being human. Now, you might think, well, that sounds wild to me. I'm not a transhumanist. But I would ask you if you haven't already participated in it. Anybody here wearing glasses? So you've adopted a technology to overcome some of the limits of your humanness. Anybody have a stent? Artificial hip? Cochlear implant? Anybody wearing clothes? We're all participating in this some way. The question is, where do you want to draw the line? Well, transhumanists are arguing that technology should be that which we embrace to deal with the human experience. And it might lead us along the evolutionary train beyond what we look like now. There are three ways in which folks talk about transhumanism. The transformation of the self, the individual, the transformation of the world. And then there are folks who you might have heard of, there are actually some of them in Russia, based on a particular philosopher, who think of us not just in terms of androcentric or geocentric, but cosmic. Why limit to where we might be? You could translate yourself into something that participates in the entire universe, not just this little speck of dust. Now that might sound odd to you, but there are three ways some folks, folks talk about this. Integrated symbiosis, embodied cyborgs, and unembodied mind upload. Right now, there's a very interesting artist, technologist, designer in Holland by the name of Joris Larsman. On the top, it's a picture of what he calls a bone chair. The bone chair is actually constructed in terms of 3D printing that makes molds. And you'll notice where the joints are in the bone chair, modeled on the way in which our actual bones are created. And so the, the bones that you and I have are porous in certain sections and thicker in others that deal with the stress points. And as we move about, our body actually adjusts these things. That's how the bone chair was constructed, by an algorithm that figured out where the stress points are and so more substance goes to one place and less substance to another. Below that is a model of a bridge that Larsman and his folks are building across a river in Amsterdam. And the way they're building it is with robots on the bridge, 3D printers that the robots have. And as the robots build it and experience the pressure of the various parts of the struts and the frames, changing what the building is actually looking about. So they're designing it as they go. It's an organic move. Well, think about that some in terms of artificial hips or artificial knees or forms of implants of various skull materials. Or if you're at an aeronautics university, the design of an airplane or wings. It's going to get faster. It's going to get lighter. It's going to get stronger because of an organic symbiosis, moving from the natural to the composite. 
Or you could go the other way, from the composite to the natural. That is, we start to involve our bodies with the technology. Most of the time when we think about technology, we tend to see the stuff that's outside of us. What we don't see is the stuff that's coming more and more inside of us. And so we now have ways of actually moving beyond nerve systems, moving beyond muscular systems by incorporating machinery into us. Well, what happens when that starts to move to a carbon-based rather than a silicon-based substrate? We will become enmeshed with a new way of being. And finally, there is a theory that we are basically information processors. From the biology that we have to the fact that we're interpreting beings. And so there are folks, serious folks, who are working backwards, reverse engineering the way in which we put information together to actually map the brain as it deals with the information that comes to it and creating an algorithm that will, in fact, upload our minds to a different substrate so that we're not bound by this organic substrate. Emulation in this mode doesn't mean exactly the same, but close enough on the different substrate that we wouldn't know the difference. Am I running out of time, Mark? Okay. So, given these possibilities, maybe we should ask about the second inning before we get too excited about the first inning. Because it's really hard to predict the future once you have smarter than human things around. Now this has occurred all along. I hesitate to tell you this, but when my parents got their first VCR, I got a call about every other day about how to set the clock on the VCR. Because the machine was smarter than they were. And I vowed that when I got something like this, I would never call my kids. And I have kept my vow. I do call my grandkids <laughs> to explain to me one more time, how do I do this thing on Xbox One? Why will Cortana make my dog leave the room when I don't want her to? We're coming to grips with the reality that the power to make the world more open and equal is not in the technologies themselves. It all depends on how the tools are designed and how we choose to use them. We dictate our future, not the machines. So what I'm really interested in is the responsibility that we have for what we create. And I like to think about this in three ways. We have a responsibility for the thing we create, that is, what it does or will not do. And we have a responsibility to those things which we create especially as those things we create become more and more like persons. And we have a responsibility to ourselves to be self-examiners as creators. What does it mean for me to be a creator? How does that put me in the world? In other words, we can't just develop hardware or software. We have to develop moral wear. So we should not be just asking, can we do this? But should we do this? And if we do this, what will that mean? And the questions arise on two levels. A theoretical level, should we pursue strong AI? Can it be done? Can computers actually emulate wetware, this thing up here? There are a number of computer scientists who argue that's not possible, that we are analog all the way down, and no matter what digital does, it won't get there. How do we go about making these decisions? How should we construct this conversation? But on a practical level, and we're already asking these questions, what will we become? What will we do? Once you have self-driving trucks, how many truck drivers do you need? Once you have self-flying planes, 
How many pilots will you need? There was a time when we needed lots and lots and lots of whalers. And then whale oil wasn't necessary anymore, and we didn't know what to do with whalers. Today, a lot of the social disruption we're taking, that's taking place in our country and countries around the world is what do you do with displaced workers where the machines are doing a better job at a cheaper rate? And so now we have to figure out what are we going to do as a society with one another? How do you answer those questions? Now you know why I'm here. Because I don't think that mathematics and neuroscience and psychology and computer engineering and cybernetics can be separated from things like philosophy and economics and literary theory and art appreciation. We need to start thinking about ourselves not just as in this block or that block or that block, but as human beings in conversation. How do you do that? You start with the notion that the technology need not shape us. We shape the technologies and in turn the technologies shape us and it is a reciprocal symbiotic relationship. Secondly, we need to think about what we want that process to be. We won't consider all of the contingencies. We'll never get to the place where we can understand all the implications of technology at the local or the organizational or the global ways that they impact us, but we'll do a lot better job in that if we're thinking about it before we're there. Simply put, the future is not predetermined. We can fashion it. Third, we need to think about both the physical and moral spaces we occupy together. What do we want ourselves to be communally, not just individually? Finally, we need to deliberate about what we consider to be our core values and our core beliefs as a community. Or to put it another way, what do we wish for when we think of model citizens and model communities and model persons? I look forward to conducting that conversation with you in a few minutes. I'll just end by saying this one thing. Lots of times, you've probably seen this um, commercial that Microsoft's put out with a pretty prominent wrapper that ends with, what can you do with technology? Question us also, what can technology do to you? And we need to think about both those questions together. Thanks for your time and your attention. I appreciate it. Dr. Stephen Cratchit. Good job. Have a seat. Sometimes I prefer the commercial, what's in your wallet? <laughs> and Dr. Kravchik, you'll be comforted to know I don't think there are many in our audience that haven't called upon children or grandchildren to help. I did it last night. Can you help me out, Charlie, with my son? Um, you touched on so many things. Our students, we're going to ask you to think about your question, and we'll have you come down to microphones. We want to get you on record for this program of asking your question to Dr. Stephen Kravchik. I want to go right into a contemporary issue. We discussed it earlier today, the Facebook issue. You touched upon it briefly here. Have we become so checked out in terms of thinking ahead because of technology that we just check yes, 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 and we're into Facebook without even thinking about the information that we're giving them that could be used? It's part of your theme of not of the unforeseen circumstances, and now we're living that out with this Facebook story. How many people, when you get a push upgrade for your operating system, scroll to the bottom real quickly and click accept? <laughs> Me too. Right. Have you ever tried to read it? <laughs> your machine probably would run out of battery life if you did. We, we've just tacitly assumed that all of this is morally neutral. And it isn't. It has implications for us. So folks are sort of frustrated with Zuckerberg and Facebook right now, but they didn't do anything in some ways that they didn't tell you they were doing. 
we all agreed that we would tell them what we like and what we don't like and what books we read. And, and there's a lot of pluses to that, right? You discover a lot of people that are interested in the things you're interested in. But there are some minuses to it as well. Um, you probably experienced it when you get robocalls or you're reading the Atlantic Magazine online or the New York Times and up pops an ad for something that you didn't expect to see because those things are linked. So um, not too long ago, my wife was looking for some lingerie and was browsing on my computer. Uh oh. And so every time I pick up the New York Times, they tell me I'm interested and maybe I would like this. <laughs> well, when I accepted the, the online version of New York Times, I told them tacitly, sure, send me stuff. And they've made it harder for us to get rid of ad blockers. We, we're going to have to become more conscious about the relationship of freedom of information to how free can it be. So following that, when you see ad choices and you click it, you also get a prompt that says, too many ads, not relevant, what have you. You're giving them more information. Right. Because you're not telling them not to contact you. You're just saying, I'm not interested in this, so let's try something else. Yeah, you're, you've given them another preference. Namely, I, I need flannel underwear and, and um, you know, the kind that my kids wore with footies in them. It, you just... Mm -hmm. All right, a show of hands. How many in our audience tweet at all? Use Twitter at all? Not, not as a few, okay? Yeah, you fewer made a, than I thought. We made, you made a very good point today, earlier, about the fact that tweeting has affected the reading of the American people. That conversations are going away, which is why it's no surprise that somebody can find that they can get their thought across in 140 characters, but it's really setting the stage for a breakdown in communication because people don't communicate. They almost don't know how to do it anymore. Well, things are better. We can actually use 280 characters now. Um, Shows how often I tweet. <laughs> so in full disclosure, most of my life I spend teaching people how to read the Bible. That's what I do at Emory University. I'm a religionist and I teach history of interpretation of early Christianity. And a few years ago, a, a very thoughtful um, interpreter decided that she would tweet her way through the Bible. So every day you would get a tweet about a chapter of the Bible. And I've had a hard time convincing my students that it's really hard to understand Genesis in 280 characters. It's hard to do foreign policy in 280 characters. But we have national leaders suggesting that you can do that. So if we model that to folks who are looking at us to see how should I do this, we construct a certain habit of what our conversations will look like. Anybody watch the local news at all anymore? A few of us. You have to be really old and you know that who's watching it because there's Cialis commercials and Metamucil commercials. And <laughs> now the morning version is different. It's because um, most of the people that are watching that are folks that have small kids. And so there you have things like what kind of foods to buy or household goods, that sort of thing. But if you look at the screen, what's on it? It's not just some people talking about the news. There's a scroll across the top. There's a scroll across the bottom. There are ads down the right-hand column. On the left-hand column, there's information about how you can contact them through Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter feeds. And one of them has a scroll at the bottom that says, I know you're getting impatient, but I'm going to tell you when this story is coming up. Because we've habituated ourselves, in fact, you're probably leaving this conversation right now, <laughs> not to listen very well. If it doesn't come in a short soundbite, we don't know what to do with it. But most of the stuff that I was talking about here requires some serious reflection time and some capacity to listen. And so we're going to have to rehabituate ourselves. We're going to have to think in terms of 
How can we become communities of resistance? We, we may actually have to not read things online for a while. Five years ago, we had a computer specialist sitting right where you are. And he said that the use of computers and the internet with our impatience is tantamount to a drug addict because we're click, 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 and you're waiting, and then you cause more problems because you've clicked so many times. And has the technology, is that the, uh, another unforeseen circumstance of the technology? Because we've gotten it so fast, now it's not fast enough? Well, let me respond in, in two ways. It's not unforeseen to the people that wrote these programs. <laughs> Google doesn't get paid if you stay on page one. Google gets paid every time you leave a page and go to another site. And the way they make their money is by selling ads and getting eyeballs on sites. So the folks that design the web page for Google don't design it for you to stay there. They design it for you to leave. The, the amount of time we actually spend on a web page is less than three seconds average. And if you look at the shape of a Google web page, you'll see that there's a lot of information at the top of the page, and then it starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller, kind of like a capital F, which if you want to scroll down, too bad. You can't get any more. Learn more means click. So for lots of folks, it's not unintended consequences at all. It's an intended consequence. And but for you and me, yep. it actually sets off chemicals in our brain to discover stuff. So I don't want to be crude about it, but it's not too much different than uh, rats in a maze, where if you tap the, the lever, you get a sweet treat. We keep tapping the lever to get a sweet treat. So it's actually affecting our brain chemistry. We talked earlier today about unmanned vehicles, the unforeseen circumstances, like if you can create technology that allows you to have driverless cars, driverless trucks, drone vehicles where you don't have to fly into a situation. There may be, there are responsibilities. You suggested to me societal responsibilities if we displace people who have made their living traditionally doing a job like driving a truck. And I said, well, whose responsibility is it? Is it the, the truck companies to retrain these people? Is it uh, technology to find something else for these people to do. And the reason I brought it up was CBS News reported that there'll be approximately a 60% drop in truck driver opportunities in the next four to seven years simply because of driverless technology. Can you speak to that? Because it follows in your theme. So uh, having claimed that I'm not a computer scientist, and I'm not an engineer, I'm also not an economist or a social psychologist. But I don't think we're going to, and I'll use some technical language here from computer work, we're not going to be able to offload this onto some unknown other. We're going to have to start thinking about ourselves as an organic entity. So it's not what do I do with former truck drivers or what do I do with former forklift drivers or what do I do with former folks who used to be ditch diggers? It's how do I take care of my neighbor? And we're going to have to sort of change to not just ask about us and them, but the common wheel of the we. And the only way I know to get that is to go back to those last slides of asking what are our core values? What is it we want to be? What is it we wish to be? How do we envision our future and then work towards that? I, I know that's not a specific answer, but I think it actually starts with those kind of conversations. Time Magazine had a story that came out today that said that scientists have discovered a new organ in the human body. What is the Interstitium, you can say Interstitium. Can. Interstitium, what is that? It's a fluid highway. Um, and the way that pathologists discovered it is the way in which usually a skin biopsy is tested is you dehydrate it and then you sort of slice it up into various small bits and then you infuse it with dyes and you can see what the different cell structure is. Well, this particular organ 
is the space between various layers of skin, what makes up our skin, and the fluid runs through it, and it runs throughout our body. So one of the things they're discovering is that this may be the way in which certain cells move around through the lymph system. Why cancers spread could be through this system. But if you dehydrate the, the flesh that you've taken out, you collapse the organ. So it's only been through new forms of technology that enable us to look at that, that we discovered this organ. That's been there all along. We're gonna take questions from the audience. Can we have our students come down and ask your question directly to Dr. Kraftchik? By the way, while this person's coming down, I'm not a pathologist either. I just want to. <laughs> if you were right into the microphone, you can. Thank you very much, Diego, for helping. We have two microphones set up, so we'll go from left to right. And you're first today with Dr. Kraftchik. Go ahead. Hello. You briefly mentioned um, the notion of how we might adapt to various people being displaced. So my question is, in what seems today to be all but inevitable, our society reaching a state of full automation in which all non-creative or social tasks are automated by machines. How can we reorganize our society in a way where all the benefits of that automation isn't just you know, companies like Amazon, Google, um, essentially profiting without having to have consumers because if, if everyone is displaced, they won't have consumers. How can we reorganize our society to adapt to the concept of full automation. Wow. So if I could do that, I mean, if I could answer that question. How can we think so, about an answer? So let me, let me suggest a couple of things. One is it's not a zero sum game. We've been here before as a culture. Every technology which displaces previous ways of being creative, active human beings creates new ways of being creative, active human beings. So in the 1800s, there were plenty of people who thought about flight when you get certain kind of adjacent technologies that it can occur. The early 1900s, first flight over in Kitty Hawk, or I know there's some debate about whether that's true or not, how many people were actually engaged in the flight industry? A handful of folks, right? But as the technology starts to be used, eventually you don't just need some people that are interested in it. You need pilots, and you need mechanics, and you need air controllers, and you need folks to figure out systems of how to land them and take them off. So. There are new ways for us to be with one another. And I think sometimes when we talk about this, we think, well, we've taken away those jobs, and so nothing comes back in. But the new technology brings new ways to be. And, and we will, in fact, discover that. I, it, Thank you. I'm sorry, that's... It's a know, tough one, to be continued yeah. in another forum. If you would state your first name, your year of study, and your field of study, welcome. Uh, I'm a second year aerospace and occupational safety student here at Embry-Riddle. Um, we talked about Twitter briefly. Um, my question is, uh, do you feel that technology, especially social media, uh, is controlling how we think um, a certain way, or perhaps it's making us lose touch with what's really important? I don't think it's controlling us. I, I do think it's significantly influencing us. And I think we have to become more conscious of that. The technologies are not neutral. They, we've sort of known that for quite some time, but every time a new thing hops around, we get really excited about it. It's only later that you sort of think, that wasn't so great. I should look at it again, right? So. If we don't reflect on them, then yeah, they control us. But the reflection requires a sort of second question. Um, to step back and read deeply, to, to sort of look at the structure of what's being communicated, what gets 
put in front of us, what gets left out. And this is a pitch for the humanities at this point. Uh, in my state, the, the Board of Regents keeps wanting to argue that we need to get rid of things like the arts and philosophy and anything that's not practical. And my question to those folks is, how did they make the decision that we need to get rid of those, that you had to be trained in the arts and philosophy to have that question? We need, in order for that not to control us, to learn how to become critical thinkers. And the way you get to critical thinking is by engaging those parts of our culture that take us to limits. And the places where we're taken to limits are things like poetry and art and sculpture and comedy. And so we need to enmesh ourselves in those things in order to not end up being in control by simply information. We come over to the left now. Your name and right into the microphone, please. Your yes. question for Dr. Kraftchik. Yes, my name is Sean Bullock. I'm a freshman uh, attending here. and My major is in aerospace engineering. My question is uh, based on what you just said about social media. Do you think the amount of technology we have and the amount of social media we have is causing us to be not as creative or unoriginal in our everyday lives or activities or even in writing? Is it making us non-creative? Yes, like the amount of technology we have and same with social media as well. I don't, I don't think so. Um, it's just changing where we're creative. So, and we should pay attention to the, that fact that there are lots of folks who do really interesting things with social media, creative things, but they're different. So. There was a time when the way in which you had music in your home was to have a musical instrument. And we learned how to be creative with musical instruments. And eventually, you could bring something into your home, like a radio or a phonograph player. And one skill that we had became less essential in order to appreciate music. It's a different form of music, but folks were creative with that new technology. Right now. Steinway, the piano company, is producing a grand piano that's a player piano, but not like the old timey player pianos. It's got a computer system in it, and they have digitized the masters on the piano. The algorithms are in play so that what's digitized isn't just the notes but the amount of pressure put on a, a hammer strike, the reverberations that are muted or made louder with the pedals. So you can literally recreate the sound of a Van Cliburn with a player piano now. Folks are gonna start to write music for that kind of computerized piano. We're gonna learn how to play piano better that way. We have algorithms right now. In fact, you can, for a few bucks, send away and get a song written for you by a computer. Computers write jokes, too, by the way. Um, and lots of the news feed you get a computer constructed. But that doesn't mean we won't still have people composing music. It just means that you can try out all these different ways of doing it, kind of like modeling what a wing design will be or a car design will be, in order to see what works and what doesn't work. And the creative process will still be there. It'll just be exercised in different ways. But we have to exercise the disciplines that enable us to be creative. In the late 1960s, a rock group called Zager and Evans did a song called In the Year 2525, Will We Still Be Alive? The song takes us through several decades, some of our uh, more veteran viewers will remember that, to the point where you didn't even think you're, you had a shell for a body. Are we headed that way? Because of technology? <laughs> Putting you on the spot, sir. Um, I don't think so. I, I don't. 
If we are, the we that we are won't be that we. The human being is an embodied being. It's the, the mind is not just in the brain. In fact, what we are is a collective of colonies of organisms. So the, your microbiome actually is a thinking mechanism. I don't think we're going to end up as a series of mechanical brains and vats. I think that it's more likely that we're going to adapt to the, the social conditions. That's, that's what we always do. That's what technology does. But I don't think in the next eight years um, you and I will be a hologram. I, I think okay. that more likely in the next 50 or 100 years, your grandchildren or their children or my grandchildren or their children will learn to live with another kind of set of personas. The, the, in the same way that we're discovering, we need to learn to live with other kind of animal persons. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we're going to have to learn to live with other kinds of persons on that end of the spectrum. But I'll accept that statement. We'll, let's go back to, right to the students, right into the microphone, if you will, your name and your question for Dr. Kraftchik. So I am Nicholas Van Riper, a freshman studying space flight operations. And so uh, Isaac Asimov wrote extensively about things like uh, the laws of robotics, his three laws, and eventually himself determined that they were flawed. Do you think that the concept of uh, three laws of robotics will have relevance in the future of things like artificial AI? Yes, but so how many folks have um, just recently read Girdle's Incompleteness Theorem? I know it's a sort of daily staple for most folks. Or, or dealt with um, recursive functions and, and you know that certain recursive functions are just not predictable. Sometimes you can run them and run them and run them and beautiful things occur. So you've probably seen computer generated uh, branching programs, right? Sometimes you run them and they just fizzle out. And they're, they're unpredictable because Sufficiently interesting systems are always incomplete. There are sentences in the systems that we can't determine the truth or falsity of. And that goes all the way down to the basics of everyday integer mathematics. What that means is as long as we're involved with having to create algorithms, which is what right now we're having to do, there's a certain degree of unpredictability built into that. And it's a good thing. Because without it, nothing new occurs. But it's also a challenge to any rule-based system. So we'll need them, but they won't be able to determine always exactly what's going to happen or what should happen. Now my mother will be thrilled that my mathematics training was not Another thing pissed away by my son. So <laughs> right over here now, your question. Right into the microphone. Thank you. Well, I'm Keneal Matthew C. I'm an aer senior aerospace engineering student, astronautics track. And I'd like to ask you about in this, um, let me preface this with, in this uh, sea of, uh, this continuum of consequences, continuum of all consequences, how do we deal with the unintended consequences of consent and knowledge once the technology becomes back integrated into our body? Just like our genetics. Um, Great question. Like, you know, how do you, how do you, we're already dealing with the issue of like, I carry cancer genes. How do we take that one, I carry nanites or I carry modified genes and may not even know it? Yeah. And you thought this was going to be an easy night. No, I, no, I didn't. I think that at all. Um, but I didn't. I don't know how you can deal with all those contingencies. Um, 
I guess the only answer to that is what makes human beings human beings is that we are always and everywhere interpretive beings, including interpreting our interpreting mechanisms. So unlike other forms of sentient beings, what, what we can do is reflect upon the way in which we reflect. And when you do that, you start asking questions just like the one you asked. And once you start asking those questions, you can start to think about ways to solve them. And, and really, all I'm suggesting is that we give a lot of time to doing just what you did, but not individually, in corporate construction. Because it, it strikes me that multiple forms of intelligence are more intelligent than individual forms of intelligence. So there's only a few IQ points between Albert Einstein and a C student. I mean, I'm, we're talking a small amount of IQ points. But if you can get Albert Einstein and the C student to talk together, then the cumulative intelligence of both those people goes up. And, and that's what we need to do in, in order to sort of ask those sorts of questions. Let's come right over here. Your question now. Uh, good evening. I'm Josh, uh, aer uh, aeronautics student, freshman. Uh, my, I guess my question is, with the exponential growth of technology and artificial intelligence, do you think there will ever be a wall that we hit where we like, cannot upgrade or update? You mean sort of like with yogurt? I mean, there's an expiration date or... Um, I've never quite understood that, actually. It, it seems to me that, by definition, yogurt should just keep being yogurt. But um, Yeah, I think we're going to hit some limits of what we are doing now in terms of the hardware and the software, because we basically worked in serial forms of computation. It's kind of stackable form. But it seems to me that, from what I've read about it, quantum computing sort of breaks through some of those barriers. And so what looks like what might be a limit, a sort of asymptotic drift, may in fact get broken through by a new way of thinking about that. And that's not unusual for what technology does. It, technologies are always a way of coping with the human experience in the world. So the first time we got from being moving around on all fours and stood up, our hands were freed to pick up sticks or rocks or flint. Our, the structure of our feet changed from our primate relatives, and we got arches in our feet, which enable us to walk long distances. So there's, there's always a limit to the present technology that a new form of technology is devised to overcome. So what we have right now will eventually hit the limits that you're talking about, but when we do, it will raise up new ways to think about how do you transcend that limit? And I don't know if there's a limit to those limits. There is a transhumanism question that has not been asked yet, and we're going to come right back to this student as well, that there is a common belief among some people, and this could be black helicopter stuff, if you'll pardon the expression, doctor, that the reason we have not found a cure for cancer yet is because of the un- known circumstance that happens as a result of people living longer and a crowded planet that becomes more crowded because disease does not take these people out. It may sound macabre and crazy to suggest this, but it's hard to believe that if there was a cure for cancer that we wouldn't apply it now. Does this ever come up in debate among any of your students in any place that you've spoken 
about we, we could find a way, like the common belief was that we could make a car that never has to be replaced, but it would kill the industry because cars would not sell. Have you ever had that debate? Or sure, raise, people raise that question? It, it's, a, it's a bit more complicated. So, so radical transhumanists, the way in which you overcome that is you shed the flesh sack and you don't have to worry about it any longer, which is in effect what Ray Kurzweil is trying to argue. The, the debate there becomes if the substrate is a form of silicon as opposed to a carbon-based things that you and I are, is it the same thing? Technically speaking, there is no such thing as cancer. There are numerous cancers. So we don't have, oh, that's such and such. What a cancer is, is a cell replicating itself in ways that we can't predict. Okay. So it's back to this other question that you asked. Um, and I think we're targeting certain ways in which to work with cures for cancer, but not all cures apply to every patient. So we're sort of facing this in my family right now with one of our um, family members who has recurrent um, cancer cells and some of the therapies are no longer possible for her because of the previous therapy she had. What we are discovering is that there are multiple ways in which cancers can be cancer. And every day I think we get closer to figuring out why those things occur. And I, I, I suspect what you're going to see is the kind of pharmaceutical and mechanical shifting of the body's own system to deal with parts of the body that are acting unpredictably. Understood. In the audience now, your question. As we take our final few in these final minutes. Uh, hi, I'm Justin Weltmer. I'm a little a, closer to the microphone, please. I'm a senior of mechanical engineering for robotics. And um, we talk a lot. You've then you should be down here talking. No. <laughs> so you've talked a lot today, or at least a little bit, about our short attention spans and 180 characters. And I'm wondering whether the way we talk about it, it's like a limitation of ourselves that we do this. And I'm wondering with the advent of you know photorealistic VR and the ability to see people face to face, whether we will just ditch the 180 characters and ditch the short attention spans as just a really short transitional period. Um, where we moved from living in 3D space to having this reach of technology through a piece of glass back into full 3D space, but with all the advantages and none of the downsides. And whether we'll recapture the attention spans and the ability to talk face to face when we don't have the limitations of the technology for you know how much data your phone can handle and the size of the screen you're looking through. I hope so. Um, <laughs> But you know, if you've been working in robotics, that what goes on up here and here requires a remarkable amount of information processing. And, and even though we have faster and stronger systems that, that have more mechanical computing power than, than this thing does, we still don't know what to do with fluid information construction, right? We, we still don't know how the brain what, does what the brain does. And in some ways, it's hidden from us because we're trying to be the subject and the object at the same time. So even if we get to where you are suggesting we could go, which sounds pretty interesting to me, I don't think we're ever going to quite duplicate 
face-to-face, self-to-self conversations with any kind of intermediary in there. It, it might be a real satisfying way to think about things. It might be an interesting way to think about things. But as long as we're embodied beings, the most intimate way we're going to be with one another is as embodied beings. Let me take our two final questions over here. So, my name is Joshua. Uh, I'm in do- I'm, this is my first year. I'm doing aerospace engineering. Uh, my question is, what do you think about the people that, you know, Every, you said in a certain point that people will go towards the future and innovation, but what about the people that want to go like back? You know, some trends, styles. People sometimes want those things back, like <laughs> video records. Now you can see new songs in records. Mm-hmm. Something that passed went to CDs, and now this is coming back. What do you think that would happen in a distant future? In other words, a lot of people who want to revert to the past, old, old things, use new technology to, to use old things. Is that going to happen more? They're a craving for nostalgia where they'll use modern technology to sort of relive or re-experience older things. It always has. Um, so in the 1800s when they invented mechanical looms, There were some folks who were loom workers who weren't too happy about that and took hammers and mallets and crushed all the looms. They're what we call Luddites. There are some folks who are Luddites. Most of the people that you're talking about are not Luddites. They're like the rest of us. But if you ask, why do I want to go back to something prior. It's usually because it provided something that was satisfying or beautiful or comforting or interesting. So if we shift from I have to use vinyl in order for it to be an interesting song to where might I look for interesting songs? We would satisfy that desire to go back, but we wouldn't confuse the desire with the particular form. Thank you. And our final question for Dr. Kraftjik. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Marco Saravia. Uh, I'm studying aerospace engineering right now, and I'm a junior. Uh, at the beginning of the lecture, you talked about uh, creation and responsibility and used Frankenstein as a uh, as a reference, and it's not until the end of that book that the monster takes responsibility for their action. So my question is that when AI is, a sustaining AI is created, that an AI will be able to identify like their own responsibility on their own, or if we'll need to determine like, or we'll need to educate them on responsibility, or if it goes back to on whether an AI thinks humanly versus rationally. Well, the the creature, and by the way, the creature only refers to itself as a monster once or twice in in the novel. All the other humans refer to it as a monster, but what they respond to is its physical appearance, not its being. And It actually accepts responsibility for its actions all along. The the character in the novel that doesn't accept responsibility for his actions is Victor Frankenstein, who outwardly looks quite beautiful, but inwardly is probably the monster. And and what I, that's the tragedy of this novel, is that what the creature desires is human community. 
And every human it encounters rejects it because it looks different. And so finally, the creature comes to Victor and says, I can't fit into human society because I'm different. I want you to create one of my kind. And Victor finally relents and decides that he will, in fact, create a counterpart to the creature so that the creature can have companionship. And what Mary, is, Mary Shelley is invoking is that early set of chapters in Genesis where the human being, all the animals are brought to the human being and it can't connect. And it says to the divine creator, where's my soulmate? And the divine creator creates the woman for the man. That's what the creature asks for. Victor says yes, and then reneges on the deal and destroys every hope of community and intimacy for that person. Whether he was human or not, I'm not sure, but he was a person. And so it seems to me that in the future, when we start creating sentient beings, the, the question won't be so much, are they accepting responsibility for what they're doing? But are we accepting responsibility for helping them be responsible? Thank you. You're also an author and have written, I believe, two books about Frankenstein. Am I correct? No, just essays about Frankenstein. Most of what I write is pretty arcane. It's um, thick descriptions of texts that people don't read much anymore. Um, so I, read, I write biblical commentaries and essays on um, what early Christians thought about what they were doing, that sort of thing. Keeps so, me off the streets. I want to thank some people who helped with this uh, event tonight. Diego and Bruno are students who helped to seat you all. And to Rob, AJ, and to uh, Tony Petro, who helped run things up there. Bob Score, back to video as well as Daryl Labello, our photographer for tonight. And Dr. Butler, it's good to see you here, sir. I know it's a very busy week for you. Thank you for being with us here tonight. We wanna to show you what we're gonna do when we come back in just a couple of weeks. Our next event will be on April the 9th. This is especially timely. It is a very big month here at Embry-Riddle for everything related to space. The Commercial Space Race. This will be an interactive event with a panel. We'll also be on YouTube. We'll be taking your questions from a worldwide audience as well as those of you who are here. So you'll get to ask your questions of our panel. And the, the timeliness of this has been enriched by our watching a story that came out of the Washington Post yesterday about a Chinese satellite that's expected to land somewhere or hit the earth in fragmentation somewhere in the next few days. So who's responsible for the cleanup? Who stands to profit? Who will police? What are the legal actions? Our panel will touch all three areas on this event that's coming up. So we hope you join us back to our regular time. That'll be at 7 p.m. on April 9th. The doors open at 6 here on the campus of Embry-Riddle. We look forward to seeing you then. Once again, please a warm welcome and thanks to our special guest tonight, Dr. Stephen Patrick. Thank you all for being here. Have a very pleasant good evening.